I'm Michael Battelle, President and Founder of the Fatty Liver Alliance. We raise awareness about the risk, causes, and complications of fatty liver disease and help those already diagnosed with mast cell dimash by advocating for access to approved treatments and care. Today, as part of our patient focused series, Liver Insights, Illuminating the Path Through Mast Cell Dimash, I'm excited to introduce two international experts in liver and metabolic health, Professor Shira Zelbersagi and Professor Jorn Schattenberg. Professor Zelbosagi is a clinical dietitian, epidemiologist, and researcher in nutritional epidemiology and mast cell and other chronic comorbidities. She's the head of the School of Public Health, Faculty of Social Welfare and Health Sciences, University of Haifa. She is the chair elect of the EASL Policy Public Health and Advocacy Committee. We also have with us Jorn Schattenberg, who is a professor of medicine and director of the Department of Medicine at the University Medical Center, Hamburg, and University of Saarland in Germany. Professor Schattenberg is also a member of the Public Policy, Public Policy, Public Health and Advocacy Committee of the European Association for the Study of the Liver, and is a member of the editorial board of Hepatology and Elementary Pharmacology and Therapeutics and an associate editor of JHEP Reports. Today, in part nine of our special series for patients who have already been diagnosed with mast cell dermash, we're going to be discussing strategic action planning for disease management, enabling patients with tools and strategies for proactive disease management. You're both uh, experts in this area, and for patients who maybe they just found out that they have mast cell dermash, or maybe they've had it for a little while, for them, this is a really big deal. And anything that you could offer with regard to tools that are available will really make a difference. So what, what's that like now? What, what is available? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Michael, for inviting us uh, to, be, to be here today and, and uh, speak with you and Fatty Liver Lines and, on an, and, and reach out, reach a broader uh, um, group of patients that are affected by fatty liver disease. And I think it's a very important and timely topic. Um, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Professor Shira Selvasarji in a second. But as a clinician, I can tell you that the questions you're asking me is, uh, um, uh, now what, doc, is, is coming very commonly for a patient that is in my clinic that I have diagnosed, that I have told about the disease, they might or might not have been aware of the disease. And, you know, that's another big thing. And I think you had uh, you uh, addressed that previously. But the big question for the patient is now what? And as a clinician, there's very limited time to offer something meaningful to the patient. There's been a lot of intervention in science, and Shira can talk on that uh, in, in the presentation she's going to be sharing. The important thing is what sticks with the patient, what changes their disease uh, trajectory, I would like to say. Um, and, and that's my clinical thought on that. And, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Shira. Well, it's really important to uh, share with the patients the what what they can do to have an impact or their on their disease course. And the amazing thing in in this uh, disease is that patients have so much impact. I mean that the disease progress is so much affected by lifestyle, and it actually gives the patient so much power to change the course of the disease. Actually, it, this is a reversible disease by lifestyle modification. Now they need to know to, to gain control over the disease management, they need to know what to do. But more importantly, they need to know how to do. Because many of them already know they need to make lifestyle modification. They were told before they need to reduce weight, have a better diet, exercise, but a lot of, of the unknown is how to do it. How do I accomplish? these goals, and I hope we will have some time to discuss this uh, in our um, session today. That's perfect. Can I share with you my screen? That would be fantastic. So I will give a couple of uh, slides just to, to make an introduction, and then we can keep the discussion uh, going. So as I said, the patients can affect uh, fatty liver disease in every stage of the disease. They can affect uh, steatosis when it's a rather simple disease and complicated with inflammation or fibrosis. Fibrosis is scarring of the, of the liver tissue. So they can affect steatosis. But what is more even interesting is that even if there is some degree of inflammation, and fibrosis, it is still reversible. So what this slide is trying to show that in every stage of, of fatty liver disease, 
or now we call it muscle, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, they can affect the disease course by changing their lifestyle, what by weight reduction, by having a healthier diet, like Mediterranean type of diet, by doing physical activity, by not drinking alcohol. And even if they have advanced fibrosis, which is less reversible, they can still prevent the progression of liver disease to cirrhosis, and they can still prevent the progression to liver cancer. We know that liver cancer can be prevented by lifestyle. So this is also something very important to emphasize to patients. So there is hope in every stage. There is something you can do in every stage of the disease. And what to do? So we, we mentioned it a little bit, and it is summarized perfectly in the muscle patient uh, guidelines published in JHEP reports in 2021. So this is a summary figure. You can see what are the recommended foods, the Mediterranean diet, walnuts, fruit, vegetables, physical activity, of course, not so much physical activity. It doesn't have to be very vigorous physical activity. Actually, walking a couple of times a week can be effective. Even some yoga or resistance training twice a week can be effective. And there is a lot of emphasis on what are the things we should avoid from the sugar beverages, processed meat, processed food, which I will discuss uh, further. So we know these components are all uh, needed to be there when we want to have uh, tr effective treatment of, of massage. And of course, weight reduction, which is uh, actually related with disease improvement in a dose response, dose response manner. The more you reduce weight, the better is the effect on your liver damage the better is the regression of steatosis, the inflammation, the fibrosis, and we wish the patients to reduce between 5 to 10% of their initial body weight. Sounds not much, but still very difficult to accomplish and to maintain in the long term. And patients sometimes tell me, so do I need to eat just vegetables, just salads for the rest of my life? There's nothing left for me to eat, right? So I, I love this figure showing that you can eat a lot of foods. Uh, you need to avoid the sugar beverages and, and, the, and the processed meat, of course, but all the foods in gray and green are actually okay. They're either helpful or neutral. So don't tell me you don't have anything to eat. I mean, this is the food that most of us actually eat on our daily life, right? And moving from from merely eating salads uh which i which i hope i convince you that you don't need to live only on salads um i really want to emphasize what you really need to avoid what is really important for you to avoid and how to recognize the foods you need to avoid from and that brings us to the topic of the ultra processed foods and drinks about 50 percent of the daily calories in many countries in the united states in europe come from ultra processed food highly industrialized food and these foods are the major source in a western diet of added sugar saturated fat and all the things that are unhealthy for your liver so what we should know about ultra processed food this is food heavily going industrial processing it's not light industrial processing it's not just putting something in a can it changes the foods completely. You get completely different product from what it was in the beginning. And it's nothing you do in your own kitchen. It's only, it's only something that the food industry can do. It comes a lot of time packed in plastics or in cans, which also contain unhealthy ingredients, which come in contact with the food. And then they actually, uh, we eat those unhealthy compounds from, from the plastic packing and the cans. Uh, these are these foods are not surprisingly are highly profitable because it's low cost ingredients and they have long shelf life and they are hyper palatable, meaning the more you eat from them, the more you want to eat. You increase your caloric intake, your energy intake, because it is so tasty. You just want to keep eating it. And of course, it has low nutritional quality, low uh, um, uh, content of vitamins and minerals and other important things that we want to have in our foods. So how, how do you recognize these foods? Uh, first of all, you have a picture here to demonstrate it, but you can look at the ingredient list 
and you can recognize it by very long ingredient list, more than five ingredients, including all kinds of preservatives and coloring. And also this list includes all kinds of things you don't recognize, things you don't use in your own kitchen, hydrogenated oil, cosmetic additives, hydro hydrolyzed uh, proteins, high fructose corn syrup. You don't use these things in your kitchen, right? So this is one way to recognize, oh, this is probably an ultra processed food and I should eat less of it. So this is how a healthy plate should look like. So yes, it contains a lot of vegetables and salad. Half the plate is vegetables and salad. This is a good method for your diet to have a lot of vegetables in every meal. But it doesn't mean, mean you need to eat only vegetables. Of course, you can have whole grains. You can have different sources of protein. Preferably not much from red meat, especially not processed meat, but have your proteins from low fat dairy, poultry and fish. So half a plate vegetable, half a plate all grains, carbohydrates and proteins. This is the best plate you can ask for you and also for your family members. And the good news is that the same, I, the same diet, the same instructions that apply for the treatment of muscle also apply for the prevention of liver cancer. So the good food for Nafeld will prevent uh, liver cancer and the bad food for, for Nafeld and smoking and alcohol, in addition, would increase the risk of liver cancer. So, so when you treat Nafeld, you actually also do prevention of liver cancer. And finally, physical activity. I, again, I want to emphasize, you don't need to go to very vigorous and difficult physical activity, 150 minutes per week of moderate physical activity, like walking, a little bit biking or swimming, even doing some resistance training like yoga can be helpful to reduce liver fat, improve your, liver, your, your cardiovascular health, your body composition, keep your muscles strong, and even most importantly, improve your quality of life. You just feel better. And, and the last slide is, what are the questions that would be good for you to ask your dietitian or your physician? So first is, how much weight should I aim to lose? And let me tell you a secret. This is something you can negotiate with your dietitian or your physician. You need to decide together what are your goals, what is a reasonable weight reduction for you, which would also be clinically effective. So this is something to negotiate. What are the foods you should increase or reduce from your diet? Does smoking also harmful for the liver? Yes, the answer is yes. What can I do if I can't lose weight? Many patients just don't, don't make it and it's fine. So we need to discuss other solutions or how can we support weight reduction with medications, for example. What type of physical activity should I do considering my clinical situation, my whole clinical uh, and medical status? And how can I engage my family members? How can I engage people around me to support me during this uh, process? Thank you. That's really great. It was a really, really helpful overview. Uh, some questions that I had come to mind, um, a lot of physicians are talking about intermittent fasting as one option. And this week we even heard one of the pre presentations was between 24 and 48 hours. That was um, Stephen Harrison said uh, is needed to really um, turn the body into a fat burning machine basically. Um, but one of the other points I wanted to make is that keto diet. And there's a lot of foods that are commercially available that you would as per your definition, call it ultra processed foods. And I'm thinking, so are, if it's ultra processed, but it's no sugar, is that okay? Or is it still ultra processed and stay away from it? That's a really important question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, there is no magic bullet. This is really important. Uh, you can try intermittent fasting. You can try the keto diet, uh, although you need to do it either under medical or dietitian supervision, okay? You need to do it in the right way. Um, it's, it's mainly for the patients to choose the type of diet that they can do and keep in the long term. So if you do a keto diet for a week, you lose some weight, you improve, maybe you improve some of your liver measures, but it doesn't matter anything in the long term if you keep the diet just for one week or one month, right? 
So you need to choose the long-term diet that is best for the patient and you do it with, with negotiation. You discuss it with the patients. This is the most important point. You can also switch between diets. You can have Mediterranean diet and then say, okay, for, for the next three months, I want intermittent fasting diet. I want to try it. It could work for me. And you can also combine diets. You can do a Mediterranean diet in the form of intermittent fasting, where you eat only six or eight hours per day, but you eat Mediterranean diet. You need to keep the diet healthy anyway. You need the dietary composition to be healthy. As for the ultra processed food in the, in the keto diet, you need to look at every product by itself. The fact that it's low sugar, it, it's good. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a bonus, it's a good thing. But also don't base all your diet on ultra processed products, okay. even if it's right. You need to eat a lot of um, minimally processed food, which you can do in a keto diet, like, uh, like vegetables, like poultry, like fish, like eggs. So you don't need to rely only on processed uh, foods for the keto diet. Okay. Uh, Michael, let me add, I think Shira, I'm learning something from her every time I hear her speak. Um, is, uh, you know, she summarizes great. And the two important messages for the patient that, again, is sitting in front of me and says, well, now what, doc? I think, A, it's not lost. Your liver disease is reversible. And Professor Shirasagi uh, said that uh, in the very beginning. And they're very simple measures to achieve that reversion. Even, you know, we're talking about cirrhosis to resolve. Now, even if you don't achieve that, you prevent cancer, you prevent decompensation. Uh, or you can uh, revert earlier stages. So that's the important message. And then it comes to the individualized care uh, for clinicians that's sometimes hard because, you know, wh what can I recommend a patient that I don't know to the extent around his lifestyle, his obligations, what's family? Are they working shift? Yes or no. Maybe they have to, do, you know, uh, cook dinner at night for a husband that works shift. So there's so many things in the complexity of life that uh, influences the personal decision set. But the, the helpful uh, presentation Shira gave was, again, there's a lot you can do for yourself with a food, having food that looks like food, food like it's grown, uh, like you know it, like you would tell your children about food, okay? It's food food, real food. Uh, and, and I think that's something important when you walk through the supermarket. And then, you know, it's not only good for you, this is also environmental more uh, uh, beneficial, right? So there's additional benefits of having those unprocessed foods on your plate. Uh, and I think that's something I try to convey to patients and also help them maintain diets. Now, the other important thing is there's no one who doesn't uh, uh, lose the diet uh, every once in a while, and that's but that's not a problem. It, it's just not about um, having to adhere, as Shira said, 100% to this or that. You got to maintain thinking about a very healthy diet and that will help you in the long run. Yeah, that's, Jorn, oh, sorry, Sharon. Sure, I just want to emphasize that, Jorn, what you said about the, the real food, it's also important for your children. This, the food that you buy to the house is the food, the food that your children will eat and you are also the role model of your children. And if you have uh, fatty liver disease, your children may, may be at risk also of having fatty liver disease. So you do good for the entire family when you bring the healthy food home. And the other thing is, it's not a matter of patient ask me, what if I fail? What if I don't lose weight? Or, or what if I lose weight and then regain the weight? And I say, it's not a question of, of, of if it will happen, it will happen. It's part of the process. And we need to accept it and it's fine. It's not a failure. You just, you know, keep going. You do your best and that's it. And I think uh, you'll both agree that it's about the fat in the liver, not the bo whole body fat necessarily, right? So if people aren't losing weight on the scale, that doesn't mean that they're 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise and the lower sugar, lower carb intake isn't making a difference in their liver, right? Such an important uh, question. Thank you. Yes, it makes a difference. Every component of lifestyle modification makes a difference. It's true that weight reduction is, is most strongly associated with liver fat, it's true, but still dietary composition by itself and physical activity are independently beneficial. Thank you. Jorn, any last words for people to, to share, people who found out that they have muscle or mash, any, any other advice you wanna offer? 
Absolutely. Never give up on your liver. It's a magic organ that has a lot of regenerative capacity. It can deal with a lot of stress that, you know, it's not the type of stress you might feel in your heart or your brain, but it's there every day for you, working out, uh, producing those proteins you need to fight infection, producing those proteins you need to move your muscles, uh, to have the whole system up and running. And uh, it can adapt. And uh, a healthy diet is the uh, uh, is the power fool for your liver. Uh, and if it's diseased, um, it can become healthy again. I think that's the more important message here. So we all need to love our liver even more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both so much for your time today. I, I'm sure it's going to help so many patients. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.